Yeah, so before we can talk about intermolecular forces, which is the force between molecules once they've already been made, we need to talk about electronegativity. So electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract a bond pair of electrons towards itself in a covalent bond. So when something is covalently bonded, every atom there has an electronegativity, which is the ability of it to attract the pair to itself. So if I had my fluorine and it shared a bond with hydrogen, this bond pair is going to not sit directly in the middle if there is a difference in electronegativity. So if one is super electronegative, like fluorine is, it's going to pull this bond pair towards itself. So then it's going to be super close and the hydrogen is going to be left alone without that bond pair. And because this pulled it super close to itself, the electrons there are negatively charged. So it gives this side of that molecule, because remember it's still bonded, but this side ends up with the negative charge from the electrons. And we represent that with delta minus, and it leaves the other side where there's lacking electrons positive. So we say delta plus. So the difference in electronegativity is just how much that other molecule is going to, or that atom is going to pull the bond towards itself. If electronegativity is similar, then the bond is going to stay directly in the middle and it's not going to matter. But if they're very different and one has a very high electronegativity, it's going to shift the bond pair. So now electronegativity increases across the period and up the group, excluding our group 18s and our noble gases because they don't react because they are already full as they are. So now the most electronegative, if you go across and up, is fluorine, followed by oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, and bromine. So those are your most electronegative elements. So those, if there is any one of those in a molecule, it would mean that it is going to pull that bond pair towards itself and it's going to create charges. So that results in what we call polarity. So a whole molecule is now either going to be polar or nonpolar. So if it's nonpolar, it means so the electronegativity is going to be the same or similar. So in a nonpolar molecule where things are similar, so for example, carbon and hydrogen have very similar electronegativities. So now that bond pair that is sitting there is going to sit directly in the middle. So now because it's in the middle, it's equal from the carbon to the hydrogen, so there's no charges. So in a nonpolar molecule, it means that there's no charges. So then there's no positives or negatives, so there's no attraction to anything else. But in a polar molecule, that means the electronegativities are different. So now because they're different, it means a more electronegative element, so for example oxygen, if it's bonded to something that's got a very very low electronegativity like hydrogen or even carbon, Okay, it's going to mean the oxygen pulls that bond pair towards itself. So it's going to move closer to that side. And that's when you're going to get a negative charge there and a positive charge there. So now this becomes a polar bond, whereas this was a non-polar bond. So now when there's a polar bond, we have charges. So now it can be attracted to a lot more other molecules.
compared to when it's non-polar. So now something can have polar bonds, but be an overall non-polar molecule, because if I have something like this, we know that chlorine is electronegative, okay? Because remember, it is fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, and then chlorine. So now it is going to pull the electrons and all the chlorines are going to get negative charges and it's going to leave the carbon positive. So each one of these is a polar bond, but because they are all in equal directions, overall, all of those polar bonds cancel each other out. So this molecule as a whole is non-polar because of that. If that was substituted for a hydrogen, then that would create polarity because now it's not equal. Okay, so as long as they are equal all directions, the molecule as a whole is non-polar, but it still contains polar bonds. So the bond between everything where there's different electronegativities, the one that's more electronegative pulls the electrons and gets a negative charge, leaving the other side positive. So now because of these polarities, we can create intermolecular forces. So now the intermolecular forces, there are three different kinds. Van der Waals forces, which are between nonpolar molecules. Permanent dipole-dipole forces, which are between polar molecules. And hydrogen bonds, which are between hydrogen with very electronegative molecules. So, but it has to have hydrogen in it. And it also has to have lone pairs. So we'll look at that now now. But first, let's look at the first one. Van der Waals forces with non-polar molecules. So with non-polar molecules, there's no charges within there. So how do we get an intermolecular force when there's no charge? So another word for a van der Waals force is to be called a temporary dipole force. Okay, so whenever you see polar like this, another word for it is to be called a dipole. It's the same thing. Polar and dipole are the same thing. So if it's a temporary dipole force, it means it gets temporary charges. So in a nonpolar molecule, so for example, I have chlorine bonded to chlorine. So now we have all those electrons around there and a bond pair. But that and that are the same atom. So they have the same electronegativity. So that bond pair stays in the middle and it's shared. But all of these electrons that are around there are in the same energy level. So now because they're in the same energy level, they can move around the whole molecule all the time. So electrons can move. And if we are sitting there, with our two chlorines and the electrons move, sometimes we can end up with a whole bunch of electrons all on the same side at one time. And if all the electrons moved to one side and it left none on the other side, it creates this temporary negative charge and it leaves the other side temporarily positive. So now because of that, this negative charge can induce the same thing in another molecule sitting next to it. Because if there's another chlorine bonded to the chlorine over there, if it gets close to that, all these electrons over here are going to say, okay, these are negative next to a negative electron and they're gonna repel each other and it's going to push all the electrons to the other side because electrons don't want to be close. So if it pushes all of them away, it creates another temporary negative charge in the molecule 
next to it and it leaves that. So now it pushes them away and that's why we can sometimes call this a temporary induced dipole force because once it happens in one, it induces the same thing that happens to the next one. And now this positive one on that side starts to become attracted to the negative one on the other. And there you end up with these two molecules or more, because obviously that's going to happen to the next one, to the next one, and it's going to induce all of these charges where there is a temporary polarity between them and you are going to create this temporary attractive force and that attractive force that we have there is a van der Waals force. So now it's a very very weak and it is temporary, but it still creates enough of a force that it would hold these molecules together. Okay, and that is why it's an intermolecular force. And by holding them together, it will create a difference in boiling points and melting points. Because that's what all of these intermolecular forces do. They affect what state something is in, if it's going to be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, because it depends on how much those molecules are holding each other together. So now, van der Waals force is usually between gases because they are weak, but they still have enough force to hold them together because there is still a strength of attraction there. And van der Waals forces will increase in strength as we increase the number of electrons. So as we go down a group, we increase in electrons. So now if you increase in electrons, it means there's more electrons to be moving around. So if there's more electrons to move around, you increase the amount of electrons that can be on one side at a time. So then the more electrons you have there, the stronger this force is going to be. So it increases strength of van der Waals force. So now if you increase in strength of the van der Waals force, you are going to increase its melting or boiling point because it's going to be higher because it's going to take more energy to separate the bonds. So always remember that if I have a list of melting or boiling points between hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, all of those ones, or Cl2, O2, I2, anything like that. If I have a list, the more electrons it has, the stronger the van der Waals forces, the higher the melting and the boiling points when we're dealing with nonpolar molecules. Okay. If I look at my next intermolecular force of dipole-dipole forces, so those are permanent dipole-dipole in polar molecules because polar molecules always have charges. So this is an intermediate strength. So van der Waals are the weakest. Dipole-dipole forces are in the middle and then hydrogen bonds are the strongest. So now if I have a polar molecule, so for example, my carbon, with a chlorine. Okay, I know that chlorine is super electronegative, so it gets a negative charge, leaving the carbon positive. And if it is next to another one, which also has charges, there is an attraction between the positive and the negative and they form that temporary dipole-dipole force, okay? Because positive is always attracted to negative. So a dipole-dipole force would come in whenever you see something that has a different electronegativity, okay? So if you have one of those molecules that is pretty high up on the list, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, with another atom, 
we can have a dipole dipole force like that. And if one of those very electronegative ones is with hydrogen, that's when you're going to have a hydrogen bond. So if there's hydrogen with fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, one of those three, you get a hydrogen bond because there are lone pairs of electrons. So if we look at oxygen and when it's bonded with hydrogen, there is two lone pairs on top of another one with two lone pairs. Okay, so now the oxygen is super electronegative. So it would have a negative charge and it leaves the hydrogen positive because the oxygen has pulled that bond pair. And the same thing happens on the other side. Oxygen gets a negative charge, hydrogen gets a positive charge. So now all the hydrogens become positive and the oxygens become negative. So now the negative oxygen becomes attracted to the positive hydrogen of another one. So the lone pair there creates this attractive force to the hydrogen. And that is a hydrogen bond. Now because there's multiple lone pairs and multiple hydrogens, that means you can have even more hydrogen bonds forming because I could have another one. And since that one is negative and that's positive, I create another attractive force there and you get all of these hydrogen bonds forming. So the more lone pairs there are and the more hydrogens in something, the stronger the hydrogen bond can be. And now hydrogen bonding is super, super strong. So anything that has fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen with those hydrogens, so for example, water like this, or ammonia, because that's NH3, will have a very, very high melting and boiling point, way higher than anything else. So if you get given that values and you get asked, why is that so high? Or why is there so much of a difference? Because hydrogen bonds are very strong. So it takes a large amount of energy to overcome and break these bonds. And that's why water has the properties that it does. Because remember in water, ice is less dense than water. Okay, which is strange because a solid is not normally more less dense than a liquid. Because the hydrogen bonds create these gaps when it freezes. Okay, also you have a very high surface tension for water because the hydrogen bonds stick these stick molecules together so strongly that they don't come apart very easily. Okay, so this is why hydrogen bonding is our strongest because that force of attraction there between a lone pair and a hydrogen is extremely strong and you can create so many of them depending on the lone pairs and the hydrogen molecules. Okay, so you're gonna always use these intermolecular forces to explain trends and patterns and things in our molecules and explain why they are like they are. So you're either gonna say it's because of Van der Waals forces, dipole-dipole forces, or hydrogen bonds, depending on what molecules you're given.